The scripture reading is from Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from our iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's great joy today uh, to have uh, Donna Cooper come and share with us God's word, awaiting the blessed hope. Uh, Donna has been on our staff here for four years and uh, she's worked in our finance office as well as with our congregational care, but leads uh, a women's Bible study and has led other studies and uh, has taken a path or a journey towards ministry. And we uh, made her a certified candidate for, in the United Methodist Church this last uh, fall. And so and she's in seminary now as well as working, so uh, heavy load. But uh, it's good to have her come and, and share with us God's word from Titus today. So let's welcome uh, Donna as she shares the sermon with us today. Well, thank you. That was a great introduction. Um, Happy New Year to all of you that are here. So, this is um, the title um, of Awaiting the Blessed Hope, and I hope that we can kind of inspire and explain who is that blessed hope. So, three years ago, my husband's brother and wife, they were expecting a baby, and this was huge news for our family, as this was going to be the beginning of a brand new generation for the Cooper family. And I can tell you that when my husband heard the news, he was broken down into tears. He himself could never have kids, and so he always promised himself that if he were ever to become an uncle, he would spoil his nieces and nephews. And so finally, at the age of 45, he did become an uncle. And all through um, our sister-in-law's pregnancy, my husband's excitement and anticipation grew for the new child. And he prepared, he prepared and went out and bought baby toys, baby clothes. If it was anything baby, he bought it. And before the baby was born, I can say that my husband truly fell in love with the child. And there was nothing that seemed that could break that new formed bond between uncle and niece. And then she arrived, and you can see with that picture there that my husband was actually tickled pink, and he stepped into the role of uncle with humbleness and grace. And so finally, when Olivia did come into our family, we realized that this was a new start. This was a new beginning, and we have many hopes and many dreams for her, and it's filled with excitement and anticipation. That same feeling of excitement and anticipation greets us this new year. As we set our New Year's resolutions, or maybe we're just looking ahead to this new year, we too can find hopes and dreams. And it's a new year. It's a new beginning. And I have to say it's just my opinion, but I think all of you that are here have started off your new year perfectly. So thank you for being here this morning. So the letter to Titus speaks of a new special event that has just happened. And it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Now, if I were writing this letter, I might tweak it a bit. I think I'd replace the word that with the word who in that sentence. So then it would read like this. For the grace of God has appeared who offers salvation to all people. Who is the grace of God? Well, Jesus Christ is the grace of God that offers salvation to all people. Grace has appeared in human form, and it was born in a manger. Last week, we celebrated the birth of Christ, and we know from the Christmas story that the baby Jesus was not born in surroundings of great pomp and circumstance, but he came in very humble, unassuming surroundings. He was not born inside of a palace, which you would actually expect for a king. However, humble and unassuming that it was, here he was, our Messiah, our king. 
With the birth of Jesus, there was just not a new beginning for a new baby. No, it was much bigger than that. There was a new grace, a new covenant, a new salvation that has appeared through him. Jesus Christ is truly God's grace for all people. John Wesley is our Methodist founder, and he speaks of the power of grace. And he actually gives us three different types of grace. The first one is being prevenient grace. The second is justifying grace. And the third is sanctifying grace. So he writes this about the, the three types of grace. Prevenient grace is a gift from God that has always been available to people. It does not require any actions from us at all. It just simply exists as an active presence in our lives. And then he speaks of justifying grace. This too is a gift from God, and it arrives through the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This type of grace only needs us to have faith that our sins have been forgiven and that our relationship with God has been restored. And here, the sanctifying grace, I found a really great um, explanation of it from our Methodist Book of Discipline. And it's a little bit long, but it says, salvation is not a static, one-time event in our lives. It is the ongoing experience of God's gracious presence transforming us into who God intends us to be. Through God's sanctifying grace, we grow and mature in our ability to live as Jesus lived. As we pray, study the scriptures, we fast, we worship, we have fellowship with other Christians, we grow and we deepen our knowledge and love for God. And as we respond with compassion to human need and work for justice in our communities, we strengthen our capacity to love our neighbor. Our inner thoughts and motives, as well as our outer actions, are aligned with God's will and testify to our union with God. God has always extended his grace to people. That is what is so incredible. We read stories of God's grace beginning in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis. We read of God's covenant with his people, the Israelites, we read of his Ten Commands for his people to follow. And now with the birth of Jesus, God has set in motion his grace in human form. Through this grace, as this letter of Titus that we just read explains, we are changed. This grace allows us to have three things. The first one is we are saved and the second is we are able to say no to ungodly and worldly passions. And the third is we are given hope. So just to talk about the first couple of items that it gives us of us being saved and us being able to say no. While we do our very best to give up worldly passions and live the self-controlled godly lives, we know that if and when we make mistakes, we are still forgiven. That's the gift of grace. God's grace through the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ assures us that we are forgiven all of our sins, and this salvation is opened and extended to all of God's people. This is the amazing power of God's grace. As Christians, we are set apart from the rest of the population. And I've always been told that outsiders should be able to know that we are Christians for our actions, our words, and our love towards God and others. Being a Christian makes us want to live godly lives. We are to renounce the old way of life and to embrace a new way of life. By following Jesus, we indeed are made new. The author of Where God Meets Man writes about grace in this way. Salvation continues to be by grace. It is grace that raises up this new man or new woman who trusts God and rejoices in the goodness of creation. The old way of life 
which is full of the worldly passions and the sinful lust of flesh, must be entirely put to death. There can be no compromise between the two, the old way and the new way. The old way of living must be put to death so a new way of living can take its place. And this new way is in our text, and it says the living the self, um, self-controlled, godly lives. But this, of course, does not take place completely and fully here in this life. We will never be completely perfect. But by faith and hope, we live under the sign of the cross and the resurrection. And that mystery characterizes our lives until the day when the old shall disappear completely. And thirdly, grace gives us the blessed hope. This blessed hope is for all of us. We are given hope for our lives today, for our lives in the future, and for our eternal lives with Jesus in heaven. When Jesus returns, he will be fulfilling the ultimate promise. He returns for us and to invite us to have an eternal life with him in the special place that he has prepared for us. He promises a place where no one experiences death, pain, or sadness, but instead he has prepared a place that has complete joy, happiness, and peace. In one of the Gospels, in the book of Luke, in chapter 2, it introduces us to a man named Simeon. Now, Simeon enters the story about 40 days after the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, Simeon is just an elderly man, nothing particularly special about him, but he gets the prodding by the Holy Spirit to go to the temple to meet this new king. And if any of you have ever been prodded by the Holy Spirit, you probably know that you can ignore that. However, it's really hard because the Holy Spirit will keep on prodding you until you do. You do make action. And so Simeon must have been quite confused, but he listened to the Holy Spirit anyway. And he went to the temple to meet this new king. And so Simeon is full of excitement and anticipation and wonder and curiosity. Who is this new king? And so he arrives at the temple and he searches and he waits, patiently waiting and ready for his king. After reading that section, I was immediately puzzled. And I go, well, isn't that how we should be awaiting Jesus in our lives, being ready ready and waiting? We can and should await his return, but not with dread or fear of the unknown, but we know that he has an eternal promise for us. His promise is eternal life with him. And this is exactly what our Titus text this morning is telling us about. And it says again, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Author John Piper said the following about salvation. It's quoted, salvation or saving faith is not just the persuasion that the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus actually occurred. While it is true that that is essential to the saving faith, however, it is not the full essence of it. John Piper refers to Luke chapter 16, and he writes, The devil knows that Jesus was born, died, and rose from the dead. However, the devil is not saved. The full essence of saving faith is seeing the supreme beauty of Christ in the meaning of his birth, death, and resurrection, and then embracing Christ as Savior and Lord, and truly knowing that he is our greatest treasure. The evil one does not see this crucified and and risen Christ as beautiful or as a treasure. But believers do see Christ as supremely beautiful, and we do treasure Christ. That is the full essence of saving faith. Through the birth, 
of Jesus, his death and resurrection, we do see that God's grace has appeared and it has been extended for all of us. Jesus came to change and to impact our lives and he will come again. But how do we say no to ungodliness and worldly passions? Well, it's right there in the text. It says we can say yes to self-controlled and godly lives. Jesus tells us to love one another. That is his greatest command. If I went around to ask each and every one of you how you show love to one another, I bet I would receive different answers from each and every one of you. And you know what? Each of you would be correct. There are so many ways to show love, and it can be as simple as waking up with smiles to your family in the morning instead of grumbles and rushing out the door to start our busy day. And it can be listening to our teachers and being nice to all of our fellow classmates for kids. And it can be having an attitude of gratitude for our jobs and for our bosses. It can be giving over time, talents, and money for various mission organizations. And it can be spent in time of worship and fellowship in church events. Those are just a few of the many more examples that exist out there to show love to one another. Do you want to know why I picked this passage? It was kind of funny. I was telling um, a few of my family members and friends that I was going to be preaching on the book of Titus. And the comment was, Titus is in the Bible. So title is, uh, Titus is very small in length, so it kind of gets no attention sometimes. But its words are what make it mighty, and that is why I chose it. What grabbed my attention in this passage is really just four words, and it's in this present age. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. So again, in this present age, just four simple words. And I truly believe that that can be taken to mean that this passage applies to us and any other generation that has and will live on earth. In this present age, in this world, right here, right now, in the future, until we meet the blessed hope. This is indeed a message for all of us. And I thought this passage was fitting as we begin this brand new year. So why not make this passage our New Year's resolution, or at least add it to our already created list for our New Year's resolution? We can definitely make this new year about God. To live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives while we wait for the blessed hope. To me, just the thought this letter of Titus, written so long ago, still applies to us today, it's so incredibly exciting for me. For me, it helps me to stay focused to God, and it helps grow my relationship with God. So this passage is my New Year's resolution, and I await the new year and Jesus with excitement and anticipation. When I think back of that earlier picture of my husband holding Olivia, his niece, I see the love and excitement and anticipation. The love bond that they had began before she was even born. And I imagine that that is how Jesus loves us. Jesus created a love bond between us before we were even born. Jesus holds us with love, excitement, and anticipation. So as we look ahead to this brand new year with excitement and anticipation, we realize that we should always be looking for Jesus. He is supremely beautiful, and he is our greatest treasure. He is our blessed hope that we are awaiting. He is our new beginning, our new covenant, and our new salvation. So use this brand new year as a beginning or a renewing of your relationship with God a relationship that is full of excitement and anticipation, and embrace God's grace by accepting our salvation, by living godly lives, and by believing in the blessed hope of his return. 
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are believers in you, and we do treasure you. Please help us look forward to this year with excitement and anticipation. Please um, help us create new beginnings and new relationship with you. And we know that you will guide us and you will complete us. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen.